Welcome to Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Each week, we talk with industry leaders in both marketing and entrepreneurship and business to find out all about their wins and failures in marketing. Right now, we'll hear all about their successes and wins and what's fallen flat so that you can take that knowledge and implement it. Learn from the best, from the folks who've been there and done it all, as well as people just like you. Thanks for joining us. This is Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. And welcome to the next episode of Market Pulse, pros and pioneers podcast. This week, I'm excited to bring you another business owner who's delved into the world of starting her own business and is <laughs> having lots of fun wearing lots of hats. The, one of the bigger ones of that is marketing and sales. So I'm thrilled to be joined by Irina Mativa today. Welcome to the show, Irina. Hey, Paul. I'm so happy to be here with you, and thanks for inviting me. No problem at all. It's good to have you on. So uh, I've known you for quite some time now, and you know, you, you mentioned the other day that you've kind of finished a contract with Nike, which is fantastic to hear. Um, we're going to delve into a little bit more about what you do at Right WFM in a moment. Um, but just before we get to that point, uh, I've got a message from our sponsors for the show, gridbank.io. So if you're listening to this, you know I'm all about building content at scale. Um, sometimes you just need faceless video reels to get content out there. Um, but the problem with a lot of footage banks is they just don't look native to social. Um, that actually hinders the content's performance, believe it or not. So gridbank.io is a database of endless vertical, authentic video clips. Great for pumping out concepts, A-B test thumbnails, and creating authentic looking edits. If you're looking to get ahead on socials without burning out your team, you can get 10% off your annual subscription with code Paul, and you'll not regret it. It's really cool. Um, go to gridbank.io. Thanks very much to our sponsors for the episode. And now returning to Irina. Irina, you've got a long history in the WFM workforce management world. Do you want to walk us through a, a little bit of that and, and why you started right WFM? But before we get there, leading into that fun fact for today, uh, I always ask all of our guests for a fun fact. Some, some are more ridiculous than others. And I think you've got a belter for us today. Yeah, I am feeling quite embarrassed right now. And I think this is a fun fact that a lot of people would appreciate that actually happened to me. But uh, long story short, completely unintentionally, once I glued my mouth shut, because I went to a convenience store and I was traveling abroad with a friend of mine and I mistake an actual glue for a toothpaste. So <laughs> as soon as I realized why I was brushing my teeth, the teeth glue, it was a bit too late to react. <laughs> the, the best bit of this for me is the fact that when you say I glued my mouth shut, in my head, I pictured you being a kid. Because when I was a kid, I, I was the kid that ate the PVA glue, the white, the white paper glue. You know, I tried a bit of that. It was ridiculous. I nearly made myself sick. But like, I imagine most kids have done something like that. But how old were you? At this no, point? no, it was. Yeah, it was five years ago. So I, I was uh, very much grown up. <laughs> That's brilliant. But, but you made it out alive. You're still here. You had your your matrix mouth disappearing moment, but now you're back. And thank goodness you can still talk. So we're, we're all good. Uh, that's brilliant. I love it. Yeah, well, um, break now. Like, put it this way. There's plenty of people out there, Irina, who wish that I would do the same thing permanently. But I'm sorry, people, but I'm not. I'm not doing that. Um, so, if what? you would kind of just walk us through a little bit of your background, like some of the brands that you've worked with, and and what is WFM for anybody who's not in that industry? Sure. Uh, let me start start by saying that uh, my entire career is in workforce management or resource planning. A lot of people have a different abbreviation, explanation, or a title for this industry or for this domain, but I have a little bit of an untraditional path because I've never been an agent. I've never been going through that traditional kind of a flow from going through an agent to a team lead to then directing or redirecting to workforce management. I started directly in resource planning and I can say that I have probably seen it all and I've done it all. I've been operational in every part of the cycle. I work with BPOs. I work on the retail side. I've been on the vendor side. And after many, many, many years of being operational and doing different roles, 
I decided to branch out and start my own journey as having my own consulting company called uh, Right Double Young Them. Mm. So here we are. Well, congratulations on making the leap. It's a very, oh, it seems like a good idea at the time when you do it. And then, then it all starts to get real, especially when the bills start to roll in and, and the clients not so much. And uh, it, it's nerve wracking. Like it takes a lot of guts to start your own business. So congratulations on that. To summarize for anybody who's kind of outside of that audience, because we've got quite a broad audience, WFM is, is the, the operational management of a large number of people within an organization. So you traditionally work with quite large businesses or quite people heavy businesses at least, and help them make their people more efficient, make their processes around people more efficient, their time planning, their everything from planning shifts in to making sure that they're people are looked after and engaged properly, right? So it's Yeah, a- let me put it this way. Workforce management, in essence, is the glue that making things stick and making things work. And I often refer to it as the, the framework or the foundation of how do you build your operations and how do you work with your people. And, you know, you mentioned that um, often it is referred to bigger organizations that actually not necessarily the truth. I have worked with a lot of smaller organizations, and I can tell you that sometimes it's even more difficult to work with smaller organizations when you have limited resources, limited time to spend on different processes, and uh, it can be quite challenging. It's interesting. No matter the size. I think I think your idea of of, uh, of work and job is probably my idea of hell. Um, I, I I spent fifteen years in retail. And a good chunk of that time in stores, running stores and running 15 to 20 people in a store. And I would not go back to employing people for any amount of money at the moment. Like I'm quite happy being not quite a one man band, but a one man band plus associates. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that for me works quite well, but the day in and day out of managing of, of sickness and HR and looking after people, rota management, planning, productivity, training, learn. All of that, I've done my time and uh, I, I certainly couldn't think of anything that I'd wanted. I certainly wouldn't want to do that full time. So hats off. So it's very like people management in general is a very hard industry in itself to get right. And you've got a track record of having done it right many, many times. So you're, do you want to kind of talk us through who your ideal clients are? Who, what, what, what job titles do they hold? Who are you trying to reach when you do your market and then sales? Oh, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? So I would say that my ideal clients is every type of organization, no matter whether we're talking about retail, contact centers, healthcare, government, energy organizations that do not optimize their workforce processes, whether they're on the lookout for a WFM solution, whether they're on the lookout to um, create their teams from scratch, or they don't know why they can't make sense of their existing resources. That's basically my ideal um, customer. And I would actually say that one thing for me is that I quite enjoy chaos. So the more chaotic, the more messy, the more I'm intrigued to make me try. So if you have a lot of problems, um, Mm -hmm. let me know because I will gladly help you. You're the solution provider. I like it. Um, I guess that gives you quite a a challenge in that you've got quite a large, what what we call in, in market and the target addressable market, right? You've got quite a large potential audience that you want to go out to. And I imagine that causes you quite a lot of challenges in terms of how you articulate what you do because a lot of businesses want to kind of niche down talk about a specific area they maybe have two or three target job profiles that they go after and they they learn to talk in that way so is that is that a challenge that you've kind of faced as you're going about doing what you do yeah i think for me the biggest challenge is that including in the organizations itself or themselves, they don't often understand the full scope of workforce management or resource planning. And they often think that this is a function that basically plan people in the same way for every day of the week. And it's kind of administrative function. 
And I hope I have that going through different industries that they have a different naming convention for these titles. So they don't yeah. necessarily understand when I use workforce management, what do I mean? And a lot of people were thinking, oh, it's a, it's a tool. It's a software tool. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it's not a software right. tool. For me, it's the whole domain. And I know that it's traditionally related to tools, but I would say it's much broader than that. So there are a lot of challenges on this end. There is, there is. And I know that kind of from, from conversations that we've had, one of the things that you're quite proud of making a difference in the market about is the fact that you're kind of keen to get your hands dirty and, and practice as well as consult. So it's not just about offering advice and strategy. Your ideal engagement, I'm guessing, is getting involved in the thick of things in the middle of the chaos and um, bringing a bit of order to it, right? Yeah, I often refer to myself as a hands-on consultant because, and maybe this is my differentiator that I'm a practitioner, and that's why I said I've seen it all almost probably, and I am not very often surprised, let's put it this way. So I actually enjoy relating to my customers and understanding where they are coming from, what are the challenges, and what would I do if I have to be walking in their shoes. So I actually quite hate a lot of, I wouldn't necessarily say consultants, but a lot of people who are providing one size fits all solutions, because for me, it's like we're having different businesses, different circumstances, different people, personalities, culture. I really, truly do not believe that a single solution is a fit for every single company out there. So I'm trying to diversify and see what will match best with my customers. Okay, so moving then to marketing side of things, which is obviously the the main point of the podcast here is, you know, we want to kind of share best practices, look at things that have failed and understand how we can avoid them, all those sorts of things, both from business owners like yourself, um, and we've had a couple of business owners on, or from marketers who've been through the trenches with various different industries and businesses and want to share their experience and knowledge. So one of the things I, I ask our guests is, um, of all the things that you've tried so far, bear in mind, like let's, let's be honest as a, as a, as a podcast here, like you haven't been running your own business for too long. Um, what's, what's one thing that you've tried that you've really struggled to get to grips with to generate market and, um, awareness or leads or inbound inquiries? One thing that I would say is initially when I started creating content, I was too focused on thinking what would people probably want to read and understand about. And it, for me at least, it was a major mistake because I was kind of forcing subjects out. And in time, I learned that I'm a user myself, I'm operational myself. The things that I need to know, I want to know are probably things that a lot of people will relate to. So I kind of shifted my strategy, but I, I think I fell into the trap that a lot of people creating content or doing marketing, at least in the beginning, are doing. They are so focused on getting likes or getting followers and getting some sort of interactions that this becomes the sole focus and not the quality of the message that you're putting out there. Yeah. I agree. I think there's a, there's a real danger that it's what I call chasing the engagements, um, and people create content, they, they, they create something and it gets a few likes and comments and we use that as a success metric and do more of that same. And it's, it's natural, right? It's an endorphin rush. We've, we've created something that other people approve of. So let's create more of that. And I guess the thing that I'd, as a, as a, as a creator myself, one of the things I'd, I'd challenge people to think when they when they're creating things is who are the people that are liking and engaging with my stuff are they champions which is you know that's fine like that's that's not you know they're the people who are going to shout about you to their network but not necessarily be a customer of themselves or are you getting likes and engagements from people who are likely to be future clients which is far more important um in terms of what we're creating and often, like, I, I don't know whether you've had this yet or not, but I often get people dropping my inbox who've never, ever engaged with me once in three, four years. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, Paul, I've been following you for six months. I've seen loads of your content. 
that for me is, is I have to try and remember those moments where I'm going through the tough times when I want to chase the metrics. I have to remember those moments and, and think back to them and use that as validation for sticking with my strategy. Is that, is that kind of where you're at, I guess? I, I so much like and appreciate that you're uh, mentioning that because especially in the beginning when I was in that loop of uh, complaining to my husband, nobody likes my boss. I don't know what's happening. It sounds very fun. It sounds very smart. It brings value. I actually started getting messages and potential leads for people that not a single time has reacted or commented, commented under my poll. And then I realized that comments and likes are okay metric, you know, for the algorithm to boost your um, post or content out there. But the leads and the quality of leads is not directly correlated to the amount of reactions you're getting. So. Yep. Definitely happened to me and I can definitely mention that I know myself, I have liked some of your posts, but I was the one that was stalking you for quite some time before I decided yes, to true. become a client it's myself. True. Yep. And, and still seeing more coming through now. I think, you know, one, one of the things I talk to people a lot about is LinkedIn is your main method of marketing and people, well, this is the other thing is people don't see LinkedIn as a method of marketing. It's absolutely marketing. Mm. Yes, it's a social media channel of sorts, but it is the place to grab B2B leads, inbound, outbound conversations, networks, all of it. So don't dismiss it as not being a marketing channel because it absolutely is. And I'd imagine we're going to see a lot of these conversations as we move forward through the podcast series. Um, how then have you gone about trying to make sure that the leads that you get in the sort of in the industry, we'd call them market and qualified leads, right? They've come inbound. They've seen a few of your bits of content. They've, they've then dropped in your inbox to, to ask you some questions or something in general. How are you going about qualifying those people so you don't spend all of your time talking to people who might not even turn into business? Is there anything that you can share there? Oh, you know, this but, is a, a great question. Naturally, a lot of people are reaching out for advice. And I think the difficult part is trying to find balance because as much as I would like to help and advise, this is the way that I'm earning my money and I, that, that's my job effectively. I can't even, if I wish to, give everything for free. But I'm trying to, to help as much as possible. But again, if there is something that's very complicated as a question and it will require me to spend much more time, then I would be upfront and say, okay, listen, we can spend some time scoping potentially a service coming from your consulting opportunity. If not, if you don't have the budget, that's absolutely fine. This is the kind of uh, initial quick advice that I can give you and leave it there. That, that's the most you can do out of this. Yeah, absolutely. I think my experience is that the more content people consume, before they come to you, the more likely they are to be better qualified because they've, they've understood who you are, what you do, and they're probably at a point where they're ready to buy. But there'll always be those sorts of people who are, I guess, I call them tire kickers if you want. I'm not convinced it's always true, but um, if then this is good content for the episode, right? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some advice that I that I took myself was. Not everybody wants to start a consulting engagement with a full price proposal. And they just want to dip their toes in the water okay. a bit. So a good way of figuring out whether somebody, especially in the, in the services market, services marketplace, no matter what your service is, get yourself a, a Calendly link or something similar where you can offer them an hour of your time as consulting time broken mm -hmm. down, you know, not full price time, but enough to make it worth your while. So if you jump on that call for an hour, then you're both getting paid. And you've removed anybody who's not serious because they're not even willing to pay for that. They're not willing to pay for that. Then I'd have to argue how serious are they because the sorts of challenges that you solve are worth a lot of money. Um, so it's, it's always a good, good thing to consider. I don't, I'm not a big fan of making things transactional. So don't stop giving away free advice because sometimes that's just what people need to beneath the surface and decide that they want to work with you. But if they're persistent on asking more detailed questions, then okay, well, we should move this to a one-to-one a -one strategy session. Is that something you've considered already? Yeah, that's absolutely something that I am actually 
currently working on because as you said there are a lot of people who would like to um save or to actually solve their operational challenges by taking someone else's time for free but whilst they're getting paid for the results that someone else is delivering for them that person is getting paid for the work that he or she is actually producing at the moment so as I said, that's a fine line. I'm currently trying to uh, put my boundaries to say how much I can give for free because I I feel like I'm already doing quite a lot in terms of uh, content and webinars and different episodes and joining podcasts and talking and giving a lot of tips already. Yep. But uh, definitely I'm a consultant. I'm a business owner. I, I need to draw the line somewhere. But let me tell you a fun story because, as I mentioned, I've been stalking you and following you for quite some time before I reach out to you on the back of one of your posts. And for me, I think I mentioned this to my husband. There are two reasons why I decided to become a client of yours. The first one was I enjoyed you as a person. So for me, of course, the business and the results are great, but there are a lot of competitors that are doing the same work. And I am picking my people, people that I think will be a match to my personality. So these are the people that I will not engage with. Yep. And the second thing is that you actually offered me some advice for free. And then I was telling him, you know, this guy seems like he would be having my interest at heart as a customer. And this is the moment when I knew that I want to do business with you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and thank you for the kind words. Appreciate that. I think it's, Everybody's got to find their own balance of where they've given free time freely, given free advice and tried to help someone. And when that becomes a business conversation, because you're right, you don't want to, you don't want to have people free riding on your success and your capabilities. But then I also think to a certain extent, if you've got the free time to do it and should absolutely be doing as much as you can for free, because the thing that people are buy, mm -hmm. they pay for your services is you, not your frameworks and strategies and experience and things they can't buy you so they can take it like i'm a big fan of giving it all away like i i give everything away because the sorts of people that i talk to and, and i'd imagine the same for you the people that can do it themselves will take a little bit of advice run with it and fix their problems and they're very capable people um other people take okay. a one look at what you've suggested and go no i'm not doing that um and they either disappear because they don't have budget or they can't make a business case, can't tell the story for their team to get a budget, or they come to you as a client because actually, why am I trying to do this myself when I can just pay Irina to fix the problem? Um, and you know, for me, it's either it's the business case has got to stack up. It's either worth it or it's not. On that note. You know, we are currently in discussion for my own podcast and I mentioned to you in our conversation that probably I will be able to edit my own episodes. It will require me probably 10 times the, the time. It will be less of a quality, but I don't want to do that myself. I want to work with someone that I trust that, as I mentioned, will have my interest. So if it can be beneficial for both of us, if it will save me time, if it's going to increase my quality. Why not do it? And I think this is actually something that a lot of organizations should think about. We're so focused on cost savings and cost efficiency, but sometimes not willing or be willing to invest is more costly than get someone who has been through that same thing over and over and over again and can save you weeks, months, and years worth of time and problems and get the job for you. And I think this is the mentorship that will be, we'll have to work on. That's it. You know, sometimes you've got to, you've got to put money in to make the savings that you've wanted to make. And there's always benefits that you never envisaged along the way when you do that, when you bring an expert in to do what you want to do. So certainly for the, for the services and consulting market, I think that's a really useful mindset to have when you're looking at working with somebody. I talk to people about the, the video marketing a lot because I'm a big believer in video marketing. And it's not enough to talk to your target market. It's not enough to niche it down to the job titles that you know will be the people who buy your services or products. You've also got to engage them in a way where they believe in the same things you believe in. 
So you all more or less, you take the hundred percent market that you start with and you turn it down to 20% of that market. That's your target market, your niches, your industries that you're relevant to. Within that 20%, you want to get rid of three quarters of the people in that because you just want the 5% that believe in the same thing as you do, because they're the sort of people that when you tell them a different answer to what they're expecting you to hear, will, instead of assuming that you're wrong and thinking they know better, will sit and listen and go, huh, it's interesting. I wasn't expecting him to say that or her to say that. I wonder, maybe I'm wrong. And that is the difference mm-hmm. when you can talk to those people through your content, through your website, through your LinkedIn profile and help them align with you for 95% of things. The other 5% where you don't agree with each other, that's when you've got some real power and that's where your real value comes into. The, 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 um, one thing that it's truly interesting uh, that you mentioned this is that there are a lot of people that want a consultant to basically confirm that they already think which is often very wrong, but they are so absorbed by, I must be right, this must be correct. And then you're looking for someone external to kind of prove your theory that when that person comes and say, actually, you are wrong, actually, we need to focus on something else, it kind of turns out to a very bad disaster. They're often unhappy. I have seen a lot of people around me who are actually providing quite good advice, and it doesn't end well because that's not what the client wants to hear. Yeah. So that's what you decide, whether you want to yeah. be honest and transparent and do the job as if you are working in that company or you just want to make quick cash and you go with the flow and confirm what the client wants from you. Amazing. Yes, it takes courage to say no. It takes courage to say no. Been lovely chatting with you, the <laughs> Irina. Great episode. Um, I knew we'd have some interesting conversation. I wasn't expecting somebody having their mouth glued shut being part of it. Um, but then, um, you know, I released a rather interesting LinkedIn post today where I, I was, uh, I was looking after my son this morning. I got him out of his high chair and, and discovered what I thought was, um, chewed up crumpets down the side of his, um, seat. Turns out it wasn't chewed up crumpets and I'll leave the rest of that to your imagination. But yes, it's exactly what everybody's thinking at home. So we're going to overshare. There's my overshare for the day. And um, thank it you very much. Loving- yeah. Very much for being a guest on the show, Irina. Um, honestly, I, you know, if you're, if you're in that WFM space and you want to speak to somebody who's an expert, I can wholeheartedly recommend your expertise because I've, I've seen it firsthand. Um, absolutely great to have you on the show and you'll have to come back at some point and uh, tell us how you got on. Good luck. Always. Thank you for having me. And it's always a pleasure talking to you. <laughs>